you're going to get a little notification of that. And now I am delighted to welcome our panel members on to talk about a very important topic here. And uh, I, um, if you'll notice on my screen, doesn't match who we have here. Um, Duncan is filling in for Stephanie Weiss with Encore. Uh, thank you, Duncan. I know, I believe Stephanie had an emergency and was unfortunately unable to attend. So I'm glad that you're representing Encore and, uh, and really excited to have uh, Leah Bradley, who the, this discussion was born out of a conversation that I had recently with her. And it dawned on me, it's like, geez, we haven't talked about intergenerational topics. So, so these two are helping make that happen today. Um, before we dive into the discussion, I love to get to know and have our audience get to know our panel members a little bit better. Um, Leah, you and I have been interacting over the years, but uh, tell everybody a little bit about your background and what led you up to your current role these days. Sure, thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. Um, I started my interest in intergenerational programming way back when, when I was in high school and I was an intern with an organization called Inner Ages. And just looking at the list of participants, I see that Austin Heyman, the founder of Inner Ages, has joined us today, which oh, is really exciting. Yes. <laughs> I love Austin. So do I. <laughs> um, so a shout out to Austin. Thank you for being here. And um, from there, I continued on my path doing intergenerational work in college. I went to University of Delaware and had an area of concentration in intergenerational. So I have really been passionate about bringing the generations together since I was a high school student all those years ago. And during, right after college, I became associated with Generations United, which is a organization focused on intergenerational programs and policies. So um, worked with them for many years, which then led me to continue on this intergenerational path and founded an organization called Empowering the Ages in 2019, um, but between the work at Generations United, I decided to uh, see what it was like to work on the local level. So worked at the JCA Heyman Interages Center and then decided to continue even more focus solely on intergenerational work. So that leads me to today, but it's nice, Steve, that I have known you for many years since my days at Generations United, and I'm glad that you're still passionate about this work also. Yeah, and, and I really, you know, for the audience, the uh, Leah's role there at Generations United, which really had this, you know, macro level view on the world of intergenerational programming um, uh, is really an amazing resource to, for us to sort of think about this as a broader uh, topic. But what's I think is really cool is how looking at the world from that viewpoint inspired you to start your own program, which really, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to learn more about that. Um, and Duncan, um, I, 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 this is my first opportunity to meet you, but I'm thrilled because I've been a, a passionate fan and follower of the Encore movement. And for those of you who are not aware of Encore.org, absolutely a pioneering and amazing organization. But before we dive into Encore, tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to the role that you currently have there with Encore. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. Um, as you mentioned, I, I'm not Stephanie Weiss, um, and I <laughs> want to apologize for that. And I do have to apologize for not being her. Anyone who knows her, which might be several of you on this call, know uh, what an absolute marvel she is. Um, and uh, I will do my best to fill her shoes today. Um, I am 
like Steph, also on the communications team at Encore.org. And I got started in this work uh, back in 2016. My passions uh, coming out of in high school and college were um, more policy focused, um, more activism focused, particularly on climate. Um, but I didn't have a really intergenerational view until I actually worked as a field organizer on the Hillary Clinton campaign. I was fresh out of college um, and shipped off to Florida um, to be a field organizer down there. And my job was essentially corralling volunteers and just based on the region, uh, almost all of the volunteers that I worked with were older people, especially retirees. Uh, and it was a really special experience for me because it was the first time that I had collaborated so closely with older people as equals uh, and also the first time that I got to know them as friends not in a teacher student or a parent child relationship and those relationships and their mentorship in particular in particular had a really big impact on me um, and I took that experience into what became a job search after that, not surprisingly. Um, and when I saw the mission of Encore and the way that they were tapping the talents of older people who I saw had so much to offer, um, and in particular, the mission about bridging the generation divide, it, it spoke to me so deeply. Um, so I am so excited to be a member of Encore.org working on these issues. And again, really happy to be here today. Great. And I know we're going to learn more about both your organizations in your program and, and as well as the intergenerational movement at large. Um, so I'm going to duck behind the curtain. I know you all have some uh, things that you can share, but I want to remind our audience that please make this interactive. If you have questions, type them in as they come to you. Feel free to use chat to share intergenerational programs or ideas that you've got. Um, we really wanna make this a lively discussion and, a, and an information sharing resource. So I'm gonna turn off my mic and camera and let you guys take it away. Great, thank you very much. So right now in the chat, I am putting in a link. I'm going to ask, since we wanted to start with something interactive, since this is a lively discussion, I'm gonna ask that everyone click on that link. And for those of you that are just on the phone, feel free to put something in chat. Um, what you should see in front of you with that link is something that is labeled intergenerational programs. And Duncan, did that link work for you? It worked for me, yep. Fantastic. So what we're gonna do right now is focus on the left side, which says words to describe intergenerational programs. And we're asking everyone to click on the plus sign right next to the word programs and you'll get a little sticky note and put something in there. Any word you think of that describes intergenerational programs. If you agree with something that's already up there, so hopefully everyone can see there's one that says full of smiles. Oh, I see enriching, mentoring, powerful. So if you agree, click on the plus zero or plus one or whatever it is. And we're gonna just take a little um, assessment of what everyone thinks. And then if you agree, you just add on so we can see where you agree the most. So we're gonna take a few minutes to do this and then discuss. But thank you for everyone who's already putting this in here. I, I gotta say, I love this. This is this is cool. I was not aware of this uh, the Idea Boards platform. What a what a cool platform! I hope everybody can access it. But it's uh, this is really neat. It is, and what's really fun is it's just an easy way to engage people. And I'm not sharing my screen, and um, everyone can see everything real time. It's free, and you don't even have to have an account. You can just go into the homepage mm -hmm. and start one of these things. Look, everybody, we learned something really cool today. And you think about a, a platform like this with your coworkers, like brainstorming ideas, how you can utilize that. So thanks, thanks the two of you for introducing me to this. You're welcome. So we have a lot of words coming up here. Let's keep them coming. 
Um, and don't forget, besides adding your own words, definitely also see if you agree with folks, because we're going to look at what the most common words are, which right now it looks like that's enriching. Um, so we'll take a, just another minute here. And thank you for participating. Um, I am going to ask everyone to hold off on the what's missing side just for a moment. Of course, you said that right as somebody posted something. And, and keep it <laughs> keep it up there for now. You don't have to delete. But um, okay, so as I go through, I'm going to read these words to describe intergenerational programs out loud. And as I do, if you agree with something, please continue to put the plus symbols, which I see are happening here. And um, then we're going to be also thinking while you do this on what's, what's missing from this. So we have full of smiles, enriching, mentoring, powerful, wisdom, fun, creative, opportunities, lack of judgment, sharing, inclusivity, opportunity to learn from both generations, inclusive, interactive community, bridging the gaps, proactive, reduce ageism, joyful, strategic, and reduce stigma. Very good, thank you. There's some wonderful words there. And um, we have inclusive, inclusivity three times. So that number is, um, I'm gonna add up to four. So we have that updated. And just to highlight, um, it looks like the most common word is enriching. And then next is an opportunity to learn from both generations. And after that, we have mentoring and bridging the gaps. And I really love that the words that we have up there have meaning behind them, are focused on how this is impacting everybody in a positive way. So thank you. Um, and now I want us to focus on the what's missing side of this. Inspiring, we don't have yet. And when we're looking at what's missing, we really wanna focus on something that both Encore.org and Empowering the Ages focuses a lot on, which is what is the meaning behind the program? And how do we focus on why the programs are important and they're not just fun? We know that they are fun in many cases, but we also know that there's some deep conversations that are had. And the mentoring piece can be really challenging, but it's very important. And so think of those words on what could help us get to the point where intergenerational programs are seen as necessary and important and more than fun and full of smiles. So if you take a minute to think about that, and, and I see these words coming like educational and valuable. Um, and that's exactly what we today are gonna really focus on, is how are these programs all valuable and educational and inspiring? So keep those words coming because ultimately we want this document to show how we think of them initially and how we wanna want to be thinking of them. So with that, we'll take two minutes. These are some great comments uh, and I, Again, I love this platform. It's this is really cool. Cool way to uh, put together a discussion, guys. Uh, I think we'll. I can see us doing our panel members using this in the future. Great. And Steve, if there's any 
the way I have my screen, I'm not seeing any comments in the chat. So if there's anything that you want to read out loud, that's great. Absolutely. No, I, I, I will do that. All right, let's take one more minute to add words and to um, agree with some of the words up there, and then we'll we'll move into the next portion of our discussion. I feel like I should have had some uh, music playing for this. Uh, that, that would be a good extra. And also, if you do, um, if anyone is interested in doing this, um, note at the very top of the screen, it says export. You can actually export it and then save this. And so I will export it, Steve. I'll save it. And if you want to keep it or send it out, that's up to you. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, Sonia Gao says uh, Jeopardy music, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So just to really wrap this part up, um, I like how we added a lot to this. So we have inspiring, and please keep adding your numbers if you're in agreement, age-friendly, positivity, educational, valuable, training, scale, connections, analysis, what's in it for me, trust, life-affirming, share history, funding, tools for conflicts that can arise that are specific to intergenerational relationships, collaborative awareness of how and where to find these programs, providing younger generation with wisdom from older generation in a transit society where grandparents are not local and mortality. So thank you for adding these additional words. And it looks like we have a number that are tied for our most popular and agreed upon, educational, valuable connections, and life affirming. So thank you very much. Um, with that, we are going to get started with the more formal portion of this, but I do hope it's, it's also enjoyable. So I am going to share my screen. And we're gonna get going. So just in terms of today, we just did the group activity. We're gonna discuss a little bit about why intergenerational. You'll learn about oncard.org. You'll learn about empowering the ages and then we'll have time for a Q and A. So um, we're gonna start with a quote that just really outlines why connections are so important. And this is a quote by Mr. Rogers. Whether we're a preschooler or a young teen, a graduating college senior or a retired person, we human beings all want to know that we're acceptable, that our being alive somehow makes a difference in the lives of others. So that just really forms the basis of why Duncan and I are here today to talk about the importance of connections. And a pretty common definition of intergenerational programs is on the screen right now. This is one from the National Council on Aging. And I have bolded certain words that are really the crux of how a good intergenerational program is planned and implemented. So intergenerational programs are planned and ongoing activities that purposely bring together different generations to share experiences that are mutually beneficial. So the words that we've highlighted are planned, ongoing, purposefully, and mutually beneficial. And all of these are part of the best practices of intergenerational program development. And what we know is that this pandemic has been hard on everyone. And so we see intergenerational programs as being really important in how to connect people and address the loneliness and the social isolation that's occurred for all generations. We know the numbers of older and younger people, especially teenagers, were really, really high in how much they suffered 
And so the way to help all of those individually, all those individuals was, is to really engage them and provide programs and opportunities that are gonna be mutually beneficial. There was um, an article in March from the New York Times that's really focused on how to utilize the strengths and assets of the older and the younger. And that provides that research that we all know that funders want to see in why we do our work. And so quotes from that article include the elderly have so much to share with young people, wisdom about love, work, friendship, mortality, and many other things. And what I like is those words are some that were reflected on our chart that we did just a few minutes ago. And the other quote is, and young people have so much to share with the elderly about a rapidly changing world, not just technology, but new and important ways of thinking about race and racism, justice, sexuality and gender and other critical issues. And so with that, I am gonna stop sharing my screen and turn this over to Duncan to share about Encore.org. Sorry, I lost my mouse for a second. Couldn't find my unmute button. Um, thank you so much, Leah. And again, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I hope that I can share a little bit about a national perspective on what's going on with intergenerational collaboration. Um, but I think what both Leah and I are gonna focus on is the critical importance of these kind of programs uh, and really highlighting how intergenerational collaboration is more than like a nice to have, um, but something that can really go a long way towards solving critical issues. Um, so if you're not familiar with Encore, uh, we are a national nonprofit. Um, we work to bring older and younger change makers together to solve problems, to bridge divides, and to create a better future for everyone. Kind of an easy way to think of it is that we are part think tank. Uh, we're working on changing the story about intergenerational conflict uh, to one about intergenerational collaboration, but we're also part accelerator. Um, we're working to encourage more innovative intergenerational solutions. So if you've been familiar with Encore.org for a long time, you know that we have been focused in the past on uh, the older people, the older side of that equation, um, bringing older people into the lives of younger people, um, as well as more broadly, um, second acts for the social good. Uh, and both of those things are still really important to us today. But these days we are really focused on intergenerational collaboration. Like I mentioned, we need older and younger people working side by side and bringing their complementary skills and talent to the table. If we are ever gonna solve big problems like climate change, like racial justice, like loneliness, uh, just to name a couple of uh, the problems that we're really focused on. And to exemplify that, actually want to show a short three minute video here. Um, this is from one of our Gentigen -Gen Innovation Fellows, Noelle Marcus. She is the founder and CEO of Nesterly and she has a really innovative solution to the housing affordability crisis. So I hope you enjoy. Intergenerational isn't a concept for me. It's how I grew up. I was raised on Cortez Island in Western Canada. It was so small, there were 800 people on the island, total. Seven people in my middle school. My mother was a single mom and she worked really hard, but I didn't feel lonely or that we had a small family because everyday life meant interacting with people of all ages. When my mom traveled for work, I stayed with my best friend who was three years younger than me. When a room opened up in our house and someone on the island needed a home, my mother took in Jill, an older boarder. It was on this island that I learned how to genuinely connect with people of any age and to live collectively. Everyone on the island mattered. When I became an adult, I decided to move to another island. I moved to New York City. There I was dismayed to find generations siloed and a systemic housing crisis. While completing my master's in urban planning at MIT, I discovered millions of spare bedrooms sit empty every night in the United States, mostly in the home of older adults. 
The answer was clear. It was in my nature to see an intergenerational solution. I built a website called Nesterly to make it safe and easy for older generations to rent out a spare room in their home to trusted tenants. Our first customer, Brenda, lived in a four-story townhouse in Roxbury, Massachusetts that had been in her family for seven decades. A few years had passed since her kids moved out and it was becoming more and more difficult for her to care for such a large space all on her own. Through Nesterly, she met Phoebus, a 26-year-old architecture student from Greece looking for an affordable place to stay. Phoebus agreed to pay Brenda $650 per month and also garden and help around the house. Not only that, they became fast friends. Phoebus cooked her Greek meals and Brenda gave him architectural tours of her neighborhood. Brenda was able to afford the heating bills and stay in the home she loved. It touched my heart to see Brenda and Phoebus together. Their story convinced me that we were on to something. Nestorly was truly altering the course of people's lives. And their situations were not unique. Older adults are the fastest growing population in the U.S. Half are projected to live alone, and the majority have close to zero saved for retirement. At the same time, Phoebus is just one of millions of young people who are burdened by debt and struggling to afford rents near jobs and opportunities. Thanks to my incredible team, Nesterly is now a scalable technology platform that older adults trust. We're operating in three cities and we've helped thousands of people like Brenda and Phoebus. It is my dream to bring this intergenerational approach to creating affordable housing to cities around the world because I know it is needed now more than ever. As I said, I grew up on an island, a very small world, but I think how we lived in that small world holds the key to solving a problem in the larger world. Um, I hope you get a sense from that video of the potential of really creative, intergenerational solutions that tackle these big issues. Um, Noelle is one of our founding cohort of 15 Gen to Gen Innovation Fellows. Um, and that fellowship is something that we're really proud of at Encore. And it's really helping us surface these innovators from around the country. Um, all of them produced videos just like that. Um, and I can actually put a link in the chat here if you're curious to watch the rest of them. Of course, I, I highly recommend all of them. Um, there you go. Um, the, the fellowship just wrapped up its first year and we are so impressed with all of the fellows in the program. Uh, it is a really hands-on cohort experience. It includes expert and peer coaching, um, connections to funders and journalists and other innovators, uh, along with a $10,000 stipend. Um, we are actually currently accepting applications for our second year. Uh, so if you are interested, I'm going to post that link in the chat as well. That's an application link. There's also more information on our website, oncore.org, and I hope you spread the word. Applications for that are open until July 18th. Um, I also wanted to highlight one of our newest projects as another example of the, the great potential of these kinds of collaborations, and that's the Intergenerational Vaccine Corps. Uh, Encore partnered with um, several federally qualified health clinics in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, this program was funded by AmeriCorps seniors to help deliver COVID-19 vaccines to at-risk groups um, in the Bay Area. And we are working closely with an intergenerational team that brings retired physicians uh, into contact with volunteers of all ages to help boost capacity. So that includes the logistics of actual vaccine distribution, um, but it also includes a lot of the behind the scenes work that it takes to get vaccines out into the community, especially among non-English language speakers. That includes uh, things like combating vaccine hesitancy, um, identifying locations for vaccine outreach. Um, it's been a really successful and inspiring program um, and the different kinds of knowledge and experience that come from the different ages involved in that program has been really inspiring to see, uh, at least from my perspective. Um, and I just love that we're working on that. Um, so those two things are, are kind of from our accelerator perspective. And I just want to highlight one more thing that kind of 
um, speaks to the, the kind of think tanky nature of Encore that I brought up before. And that is a 13 part essay series that we collaborated on in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Uh, the series is called Meeting the Multigenerational Movement, Meeting the Multigenerational Moment, pardon me. Uh, and it's a collaboration with SSIR and the Eisner Foundation. Um, it's 13 essays and all of them are brilliant. It features social entrepreneurs, academic researchers, philanthropic leaders, uh, and they all take a really different perspective and approach to how these intergenerational strategies can help meet critical needs. Uh, there are essays in there on youth literacy, uh, support for foster families, the loneliness epidemic, and even um, nonprofit funding, um, which is an issue near and dear to our hearts, um, being employees at nonprofits. Um, so I really highly recommend the entire series if you're looking for inspiration or just to get a sense of all the latest innovations in intergenerational work. So I will once again, post that link in the chat. I'll jostle my computer as well as I do that. Um, so those are just a couple of examples of the things that we're involved with, but I hope that gives you a sense of what Encore.org is and what's going on with intergenerational collaboration at the national level and how vital it can be to solving these big issues. So of course, um, we'll have time for questions later and I can also add my email to the chat box. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me again. All right, thank you, Duncan. And so now my job is to bring it much more local to the DMV area. So Empowering the Ages is a nonprofit that I co-founded in October of 2019 with the idea that we really need to facilitate and nurture relationships across all generations and focus on the skills and the assets in ways that everybody can feel valued for who they are. And so we started a little bit before the pandemic and really focused on ways to reduce social isolation and loneliness throughout the past year and a half. Um, so some of our initiatives. We are working in conjunction with Catholic Charities in the Archdiocese of Washington, where we have a Crossing Paths program connecting older and younger generations to learn about each other and have truly meaningful discussions. We're currently working with multiple high schools and older adult living communities, as well as active adults in the DC area. So if you're representing a group of adults and you would like them engaged in these conversations for the next school year, please feel free to go on our website um, and learn more. I'll also put my email in the chat. You can contact me directly. We also, during the course of the pandemic, had a notes program, a pen program, where we engaged over 1,500 older and younger individuals throughout the US as well as internationally. Um, and we also have an ongoing concert series where we live stream concerts that were by the youth of our area, both local youth that were working through their music teachers, as well as a partnership with the National Philharmonic, where we were able to live stream concerts into homes of older adults, and also in many cases, live stream into older adult living communities. Once again, feel free to reach out if you wanna start getting those links as we'll start our concert series again late summer. Um, we have a new program that we are doing where we are connecting older adult volunteers with a Head Start student and their family in Montgomery County Public Schools, where we have volunteers that are doing early literacy activities and role modeling and working with students. So it's truly a three generation approach to the success of the students in the schools where we're also able to send volunteers and children books, puzzles, games, so that they can really role model for parents ways to continually work with their students and introduce them to language. So that's a program that we started this spring. We are working with the families over the summer and then we'll transition with families into kindergarten. And we'll be starting a new cohort of 
students and families come fall. So that's something that we are, oh, we will be looking for more volunteers who really want to be part of a student support team. We also have two high school students that send out motivational quotes every Monday morning by email. And we would encourage anyone of all ages to sign up. And the goal is really to let folks know that they're being thought of. This is, has become very interactive and individuals are writing in and sharing the quote, their favorite quotes. And it's become a community of adults that are benefiting from these weekly quotes. There's also a resource on our website focused in Montgomery County where we have where there are benches for anyone of all ages to sit down and take a little break now that more people are getting out and enjoying the weather, not on these really hot days, but in general, um, now that we're moving towards that pandemic recovery. So we have a lot of programs, but I also want to highlight there's other local intergenerational programs within the DMV. OASIS has tutoring programs. Grand Involve has tutoring programs focused in Northern Virginia. Interages has a number of programs going on for older adults and linked generations. And I know Lori of Linked Generations is on this call today. Um, also is connecting older and younger individuals. And all these programs have adapted to online platforms or are doing phone calls. So we live in a really incredible area for innovation and creativity in connecting older and younger. So with that, um, right up here, you have the websites for both Encore as well as Empowering the Ages. And we will open it up to question and answers. You'll see on the screen, we had some thoughts on some potential brainstorming we could do as a group. If you are currently doing intergenerational programming, you wanna start doing some intergenerational programming, we really can take some time to figure out how we can help you with that as a group of practitioners. But we're also open to discussion and questions. So Steve, I know you were monitoring the chat. Are there questions that we should get started with? Um, let's see, uh, just a lot of, you know, encouraging comments that people really, you know, like the idea of the, um, the intergenerational programs and what you're talking about. I also, um, I have to say, like it was I, I love the profile of Nesterly. I was um, uh, not familiar with their story, but I know we've got uh, a representative from Silvernest who's on the discussion, which is a similar platform that helps create um, shared housing and promotes intergenerational housing. And this, you know, the fact that there's these digital platforms that are out there um, is fantastic, but you know, a lot of times this intergenerational stuff, planting it in the seeds of people where you don't necessarily need a program. This is, you know, it's that neighbor across the street or it's your best friend and sort of saying, hey, what if we shared a house together? You know, um, uh, getting this into the fabric of something that we just intuitively think about as we are, you know, walking around our commun community would be fantastic. Um, so let's see, uh, let's see, Cecilia Shiner Smith, your hand is raised. Sometimes that's a mistake, but if you raised your hand and you'd like to share something, by all means, um, uh, turn your mic on and you can ask a question. Um, I would also love it if there are folks in the audience that are to um, Leah's point, are you doing anything now that's intergenerational? We'd love to hear what uh, what you um, what you're doing, and you, we can use this platform as an opportunity to promote your um, your program. Um, I know that uh, as you can see, you know, on the on the little idea exchange, funding is 
is what's missing. You know, funding is always a challenge for programs like this. Um, any creative ideas that either one of you have utilized for, um, for funding? of programs? I think, you know, we have very different perspectives as I'm a local program and Duncan is a national program. So he's able to work with places like Eisner Foundation and Duncan, I'll definitely let you explore. Um, you know, funding is always a challenge for nonprofits. And so I think that, um, you know, I don't have any real Magic great pieces yeah, of no. advice, you know, nothing more than anyone else who, you know, says apply for grants and corporate sponsors and individual giving and hope for the best. Um, but, you know, Duncan, I don't know, coming from your perspective on the national, um, if you have better thoughts than I on that. Um, well, you know, I'm not involved in development at Encore.org, but I do want to highlight a couple of things. One is one of the articles in the SSIR series that I mentioned before, um, and this is uh, by Trent Stamp and Kathy Choi, who are from the Eisner Foundation, which you mentioned, Leah, um, and the, the title of the article is Philanthropy, Philanthropy's Problem with Single Issue Solutions, and I'm reading it off my monitor. Um, that is, I it, it, it's probably not especially helpful to people seeking funding, except in the sense that it is kind of a model um, for a way to pitch your program and the importance of including intergenerational programming in your pitches um, and in your applications. And, you know, additionally, it's kind of narrow, um, but the Gender Gen Innovation Fellowship, which I mentioned before, has a $10,000 stipend. So, uh, if you are working on a pilot program with intergenerational solutions, that's a potential option as well. Um, great. I, I love uh, this comment that Stacy just put in, and it says, I've been interested in intergenerational programming for over 20 years when I began to research child care centers in long-term care centers. I now live in Florida, and I'm looking for more of this. I, I, I totally agree with Stacy on this one. This is such a, a no-brainer. And I know in Silver Spring, Maryland, there's an adult daycare and um, uh, child daycare program with the Easter Seals. But the uh, e either of you and, and Leah, with your experience with Generations United, how common is this? And, and is there any reason why when you put up a, a child care center, it's not automatically thought of to create some intergenerational component. I would say it's not as common as we all think it should be. There are some really successful models across the country. There are some really innovative communities that have older and younger in the same building whether it be through a living space, there are some intergenerational housing or through coming together for activities. Um, and what was really interesting is there was research done many years ago on a program in, in the Midwest. And what they learned is that there's a lot less turnover of staff in the nursing home when it's an intergenerational community because they have an opportunity to engage with the different generations, some cross training can occur, and the staff retention rate at this nursing home was over 90%. And for those of us in this world, that is not the norm. And so I, there are so many benefits and so many levels from the staff to the participants, to the families and the larger community. One of the reasons that I have often heard for them not doing the intergenerational communities is regulations and laws. And for those of us that are in the DC area, we know that there are a lot of guidelines. And so while we think logically, wouldn't it be great if childcare and adult day could share staff and they could share a kitchen and that could be 
um, helpful. In their bottom line, there's also all kinds of lines on if you have a child care center, you have to have X amount of green space and this type of kitchen and these size chairs and this number of bathrooms. And so frequently this, all those rules or why these programs don't happen. Um, when I was at Generations United, I had an opportunity to tour a nursing home that had a public school kindergarten in the building in Kansas. And it was by far the most meaningful and impactful intergenerational program I have ever seen. Hmm. Um, they just had two nursing home rooms that they had given to the school system and one kindergarten class every year was located at the nursing home. And I had the opportunity of, to stay for a day and I saw joint programming and music and fine motor skills and exercise and you name it, it was happening together. It was phenomenal. So wow. it can happen and there's some good examples. I tell you, I, I, as you described that program, uh, it would be great if we could feature them on a future discussion, and I'm sure it would be really inspiring. And speaking of inspiring programs, um, up in Baltimore, Keswick, uh, Rosalind Stewart um, has a comment, which I'm going to cut and paste into chat, but she says, Keswick has always paired younger volunteers with our residents for sharing stories, activities, such as chess checkers, and just to communicate. We have a program every Sunday where volunteers and residents get together uh, for an early dinner to talk, laugh, and enjoy each other. We also have an adopt a grandparent program, which was delayed during the pandemic, but we hope to get it started again. Uh, Keswick's oldest resident is 111 years old, and everyone wants to meet her ask questions about her life and mainly just see someone who's been on this earth that long. Um, that is um, great. Oh, and uh, great program. And, and I'd love to, you know, spotlight that program there, Stacy, at, at some point too. Um, and, and this is Stacy Carlin is saying, thankfully in Cleveland, there are several successful models and it works so well. I do remember reading about an intergenerational school, I think it's in Cleveland, Ohio, mm -hmm. that was a real successful program as well. And it's, um, it's called the Intergenerational School, started by Peter Whitehouse. So that's another one that we might mm -hmm. want to put on our list. Um, let's see, somebody asked a question about Encore. Did Encore do the intergenerational documentary about the musician Clark Carey, known as Mumbles, and Quincy Jones, and the younger singer and piano player we remember that was Clark uh, Terry. Um, if so, what's the name of that program? Do you, Duncan, is that something that Encore did? Uh, we did not produce that documentary, but um, the, the young pianist, uh, uh, he's actually a blind piano player. His name is Justin Coughlin. Um, it's an incredible story and a fantastic documentary. It's called Keep On, Keeping On. Um, I highly recommend anybody check it out. Um, it's one of the best, you know, intergenerational movies of all time. Um, and if you want to see more of Justin Coughlin, we actually recently featured a performance between him uh, and an older bassist. Um, that was a great, another great example of intergenerational collaboration. Um, so yeah, that's Keep On Keeping On. Highly recommend that film. Okay, and uh, yeah, I found it here. It looks like it's on Amazon Prime, so that's not bad. I'm, I'm dropping that into the chat. Um, let's see, uh, okay. Um, Carrie Byrne, I'm Carrie, founder of the mission-driven business called The Long Distance Grandparent. We have an online monthly membership for long distance grandparents where I help them nurture strong, meaningful relationships with grandchildren from a distance. I'm keen for grandparents to have high quality relationships with their grandchildren because we know it's a pro protective determinant against ageism for grandchildren and grandparents. Um, 
And let's see, let me make sure. Okay, good. Everybody can read that comment. That's great. I hope folks get in touch with Carrie on that. You know, the, and Carrie, you remind me of something intergenerational and somewhat entrepreneurial that I did. When my kids were in a Montessori school, we had a PTA and I noticed that there was a lot of grandparents that were dropping their kids off at school. And so I created a grandparents club with the PTA and we increased our membership in the PTA by 30% that year that I did it. And, um, you know, in, in talking to the grandparents is sometimes they feel a little bit out of place because they're doing parenting, but they're not being communicated to as grandparents, they're being communicated to as, as parents. And so that little change really helped to make a difference. Um, somebody um, made a comment, communication makes everything possible. Communication has changed so much. Some people still like to talk on the telephone, whereas some generations will tell you, I only text. So much can be missed by the text message. Any suggestions? Yes, I, I'm curious on your thoughts on that because it, um, we do have to communicate with people the way that they prefer. Have you seen any challenges with that with um, intergenerational communications? I mean, we, we have absolutely. And in all our programming, we try to find a way to be as inclusive as possible. Um, and we're able to, for instance, on the concerts, while it may take place on Zoom, we're able to have folks call in and just listen if they can't utilize Zoom. Um, but I think in this case, the question is more in terms of texting and, and it happens in families all the time where grandparents are trying to connect with their grandchildren and grandchildren just want to text and that may not be the communication method. And so just like with anything within relationships, it's a matter of giving and taking and figuring out how each individual can best communicate with another person. But it, it is not easy when it comes to communication to find something that's comfortable for everyone, especially with the invite of so invent of so many different technologies. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I also want to add, I think that there is opportunity for real collaboration on that front because communication is a huge challenge. Uh, and it's one of the easiest ways to kind of brew intergenerational division because both sides of the equation can get really frustrated. Um, and I think that's a great opportunity to come into things with an open mind. Um, for me, that means being willing to pick up the phone. For an older person, that means being willing to text. It also means um, really going in with an open mind and a lot of patience to figuring things out. One other issue is that a lot of younger people um, just don't check emails throughout the day, um, especially if they're not, um, you know, working professionals. Um, so just being aware of that and having the patience to work through those issues can go such a long way. Absolutely. Um, somebody asked, what is the older musician bassist's name? Yes, I thank you for asking that question. That's John Clayton, because I briefly okay. forgot the name. So I'm so glad that you brought that up okay. again. Great, great. Holy cow, I just looked at the, the, these these discussions go by so quickly. It's one o'clock. I can't believe it. And um, but I, you, you know, the the outcome that I personally had with this discussion, I think, um, was achieved in that we had a lively discussion to sort of prime the pump on ways that we can be creative about connecting the generations. And uh, you know, Leah and and Duncan, I really think it would be exciting to sort of spotlight some of the different programs that are actually attending in the audience today, um, as well as some that, that we may not know about. And so I would urge anybody who's in the audience, who's part of an intergenerational program, shoot me an email. Um, if you've got a program that you think is pretty cool, let me know and we'll see if we can't reach out and, and learn more about that. And um, the, um, Let's see, uh, Carrie says, sounds amazing. Grandparents are a powerful, largely untapped resource in many communities. They're motivated and full of wisdom and grandparents and grandchildren need to know 
each other now more than ever. You know, one of the, I, I, for those of you who have attended any of my marketing discussions, I'm always talking about Trojan horses when we're communicating with older adults. And one thing to sort of play around with folks is, is that if you're communicating to people as seniors or as elders or things like that, play around with the idea of referring to them as grandparents. Because what I've found is, is that um, the, or grands, you, you know, is, is that that person that's resistant to thinking of themselves as an older adult, if they're a grand and they're not proud of the label senior, oftentimes if they are a grandparent, they are super proud of being a grandparent. And, and sometimes you can communicate to our audience as grandparents more effectively than as an older adult, an elder or a senior. So that's one thing to play around with. Um, somebody says, uh, for example, family reunions are multi-generational, younger people, they seem to only commun communicate at funeral arrangements, family information, family reunion information on Facebook and man mainly family. Well, I. I, I get the gist of your comment there and, and hopefully sort of sharing some of that is um, helpful to the audience. I, I think, Duncan, to your point, the way that young people communicate with the older people and their families is can be different. Um, so I know I'm, I feel like I'm babbling here because I'm trying to kind of wrap up. Um, do, do Would either of you like to sort of share some closing thoughts as we wrap this up? I just like to say thank you, Steve, for this opportunity and thank you for all, all of you for attending and please reach out. My contact information is in the chat. Um, I am happy to connect on anything, everything related to, to intergenerational work and include you in our network. Great. Same here. And uh, my email is also in the chat. If you want to yell at me for not being Stephanie Weiss, I can understand. Um, but thank you so much for inviting me and having me here. Excellent. All right, everybody. Uh, well, we'll see you, I think, on around July 13th. So everybody enjoy Independence Day. I know we use that term independence in the senior living space quite often, but um, reflecting on the value of living in this country and all the opportunities that we have and um, the, the way that the generations can help all of us be more independent and interdependent as well is, is really key. So uh, thank you, Duncan and Leah, and uh, we'll see everybody after the 4th of July break. Bye.